Welcome everybody and thank you for being here for the Friends of the Cabildo lecture series. Um, this happens pretty much every Tuesday night, although we've had a little couple little bumps lately with some scheduling concerns and health issues related. So I want to thank you here for being here tonight on uh, a lecture that was supposed to be tonight. Um, just to give you a couple quick up, updates about what we have upcoming. Um, next Tuesday, we were actually able to, because of a, 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 a medical reason, we were able to get them back though. The Chapel of Love, the story of the New Orleans girl group, the Dixie Cups with Rosa Hawkins and Steve Bergsman. So I'm very happy we got, was able to reschedule them. Uh, on November 16th, we have A Friendship Interrupted. New Orleans and Cuba enjoyed a strong commercial relationship prior to the embargo by Dr. Joshua Goodman. And then our last one for November, and we do have two in December, and then we're already booking all the way through mid-February, and then we'll take a little break for Mardi Gras. So on November 30th, we have the 14th Colony, the forgotten story of the Gulf South during America's revolutionary era. So I hope uh, some of those uh, are interest to you. As always, um, if you're a member of the Friends of the Cabildo, you can attend these for free. Um, if you're not, you know, I encourage you to become a member, but for just $10, you can attend any of these. But memberships start for as low as $40 to be a member of the Friends of the Cabildo, or if you're a teacher or a student, it's as low as $25. So I hope that those will interest you and um, will, you know, that you'll, you'll possibly attend one of those. Um, tonight, um, if, well, when we do have questions, we're going to ask questions at the end. We're going to do some little question and answer session at the end. Uh, I would encourage you, if you do have a question as we're going along, put it in the chat. I'll be able to ask it of Sandy or uh, Robbie Cangelosi who's going to join us towards the end um, of these questions. So, you know, please use the chat function. It just so, you know, people forget all the time. So, and then they email me later on, ask me to ask that question later on, but I, I want everybody to be able to hear these questions. So, um, so please use the chat function and uh, we'll be asking questions toward the end. Uh, just uh, another thing, as you know, tonight is about the Lower Garden District. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the first of the New Orleans Architecture Series books, uh, 2021 is. And we do, uh, Sandy, who is our presenter tonight, is gonna be able to do some Lower Garden District tours. So I hope that you take advantage of it. I wanna say four Fridays in a row, Sandy, is that right? Yeah, and, um, including the day after Thanksgiving. Including the day after, the perfect day to get out and get a stroll on and, and do some walking as well, and work off some of those delicacies you had on Thanksgiving, that's for sure. So tonight's, uh, tonight's lecture is, as I said, is on the Lower Garden District. Our speaker tonight is Sandy Bapti. Sandy is, a, uh, is an architect with Linder Bapti Architects here in New Orleans. She's a tour guide for the Friends of the Cabildo. She's a board member with the Friends of the Cabildo. Uh, she serves on our in our education committee um, and really does, uh, she did a lot of work uh, after Robbie put out volume nine, doing tours on the Carrollton book. And also at the same time has done um, has Treme cultural tours, lower garden district, garden district tours, uh, started our Marini tour, which is now expanded to the, just the triangle and the rectangle with certain people. So she has really a jack of all trades and she's just a great resource to have and always willing to, uh, to do some research for us and, and talk about the areas we love of, of New Orleans because she loves it as much as all we do. So tonight I wanna to welcome Sandy Bapti. Thank you for being here, Sandy. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I, um, uh, like Jason said, I'm a volunteer tour guide for the Friends of the Cabildo. And about eight years ago, um, my mentor in the, in the training class asked me to consider doing neighborhood tours. And uh, there was a guidebook for them. Robbie Canaglosi had written it. And um, so I started with the Lower Garden District and went out and bought uh, volume one of the um, series and found that it wasn't just about the Garden District. It had so much information about the um, founding of the city, the history of the city and the architecture, which you know has become my passion. And since then, it's still, um, you know, one of my the favorite tours that I give. So um, 
the, lo the lower garden district got its name actually um, from Sam Wilson, who founded the Friends of the Cabildo. And he um, basically was um, responding to um, an urgent need to uh, that was um, threatening the loss of many buildings in the lower garden district. In the 1950s, the Federal Highway Act had uh, planned for, you know, the Pontchartrain Expressway and the Crescent City Connection, the bridge across the Mississippi River, basically going through the lower half of the of this area. And so he, with a group of volunteers, um, uh, you know, basically set out to document uh, the district. And by the time the book was published, a third of the buildings that were in it had been lost to you know, various problems besides the highway, you know, the zoning changes and just uh, general neglect and kind of, you know, this was the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and people were, you know, moving to uh, Lakeview and, you know, abandoning the historic neighborhoods. So anyway, um, he gave it its name and, um, and it was studied by this group of people and, um, you know, it turns out it's one of the most comprehensive 19th century Greek revival neighborhoods remaining in the country. There are more Greek revival structures there than any other city, um, according to Richard Campanella, who's measured them somehow. And this photo is one of is one of my favorite buildings um, that's on Colosseum Square. Um, you can see it's a um, double gallery uh, side hall townhouse. Um, it's a masonry structure with brick and it's got um, beautiful ironwork and columns and original windows and it's just a, really lovely, especially um, with the live oak tree. Um, so the land that um, was developed into the Lower Garden District was originally part of uh, Bienville's concession. Jean-Baptiste de la Moyne de, de Bien Bienville basically gave it to himself as governor all the way up to uh, Nine Mile Point around that crescent. And um, the crown basically told him he couldn't have it all, but he kept the section uh, closest to the French Quarter um, while the other areas were uh, sold off and the Jesuits um, occupied it. And when the Jesuits were, were expelled, um, it got sold again and uh, subdivided into long lot plantations. And uh, there's actually a typo here that it was six plantations that formed the lower garden district. Four of them were, um, are, were sort of a comprehensive design by, uh, by um, Bartholomew Lafon. So one of the reasons that the um, land was developed, you know, this was, um, after the Louisiana Purchase, 1803, there was a lot of development pressure on New Orleans and expanding upriver um, made a lot of sense in terms of the uh, geography, um, being upstream was better than downstream. And the land was, because of this giant crescent, was a, a, a large area of natural high ground. It was natural because of the overflowing of the river before levees were built. But because of this curve, the river actually made deposits on the, on the land side of the East Bank that built up that land. So there was a, a larger depth of area which made um, the plantations you know, more valuable because the land was uh, you know, more usable. So um, Lafon, Bartholomew Lafon was the surveyor architect that uh, subdivided um, the first four and then one more following of those plantations into um, lots and blocks. So this was in 1807. Lafon had um, arrived in New Orleans around 1790 um, during the uh, Spanish colonial era, era. And it's thought that he was escaping the um, the French Revolution, and that um, arriving in New Orleans shortly after the 1788 fire put him in a good position to uh, get work as an architect because 
Um, the uh, Faubourg St. Marie was developed shortly after the fire and then continuing upriver into the lower garden district. Um, um, according to the book, The Garden Legacy, he was most likely, he, he was soon recognized as one of the most respected architects and surveyors. And the drawings in the notarial archives illustrate his talent for city planning and architecture. And again, according to The Garden Legacy, he was well known and available. He wanted, he worked tirelessly to augment his income and believed and is believed to have resorted to piracy um, and smuggling, working with Jean Lafitte. Um, unfortunately, he died of yellow fever in 1820. He did have um, a family, he had a plissage relationship with a free woman of color, and he had two children. He's also thought to be the father of the philanthropist, um, Tommy Lafon. So um, he really made his mark on New Orleans um, and the Garden District is one of the most um, evident areas. Um, he's buried in uh, St. Louis um, number one, that's a photograph of his tomb. And this drawing of him is just uh, imaginary. It's something that uh, the advocate came up with um, to uh, you know, make uh, mention of notable uh, New Orleanians. I don't think there's any, uh, known photograph of him or I mean or painting. So this is the map that um, documented his subdivision. Um, to the right is the French Quarter and then next to that is um, the Faubourg St. Marie which now we know as the Central Business District and the grayer area are the, are the four plantations that he um, designed a street plan for. Um, and you can see um, so the dashed lines that uh, run vertically, what he did was unusual in the later development of plantations. These were long lots, meaning they had a, a small frontage on the river and they extended deep um, away from the river. And uh, typically the ones farther uptown, um, those um, property lines became avenues or became became an edge to the neighborhood. Here, these four uh, plantations have a street grid going over them that has no relation to those property lines except at the very um, left edge. And um, the, the drawing is a little bit bent because I took it out of a book, but he was taking the street grid from the um, Faubourg St. Mary to the right of it and extending it across. And then he shifted the grid away from the river and that shifting happens around that circle. So it was a very geometric approach to design and um, very classical, very European. The size of the um, blocks were you know, almost the same size as the French Quarter, about 300 feet square. And then you can see the um, several white areas um, that are uh, planned public spaces, Annunciation Square at the bottom towards the uh, top was a market square. That's eventually where the Dryads Market was built. And then um, I guess I can use my pointer. This is the uh, market square. Um, and this is Coliseum Square, which he shows with two uh, waterway canals intersection, intersecting there with a semicircular basin. And uh, Paranthium Walk, where I start my tours, is right here. And this block was originally designed to be a big Paranthium, which was a, a Greek name for a school, I believe, and um, or a theater. And um, the Colosseum, the Colosseum was also something was he had in mind for this. But the other streets were named after the Greek muses and the Greek gods. Um, you know, the uh, Dryads, St. Charles Avenue here was originally called Nyads. So all of this reflected um, his classical education in Europe and uh, giving back um, to the public some green spaces was also, um, you know, a European tradition. And so um, what, you know, developed you know, in maybe 20, 30 years after he um, did this plan was a slow development where initially people would buy one entire square block and put, um, you know, one house on it. And eventually, 
you know, subdivided that and began building um, smaller houses. So um, this is um, a notarial archive drawing that these were developed uh, for auctioning off properties. And the middle here are three houses that were on in the lower garden district on Peranthium Walk, um, which is now um, Ter Terpsichore Street. And you can see this is Coliseum Place. And um, these are the elevations of those houses. Uh, they're still there, but greatly uh, modified. Um, but you can see here, this had the two waterways, the canals. And so he was using water as both an aesthetic feature as well as, you know, to drain the area. And uh, the um, surrounding each block that was laid out was a ditch that was used for drainage. And in the center of each block was a ditch. So there was some, you know, practical development, uh, practical aspects to this development. Um, the notarial archive drawings was a big industry or these auction drawings, which eventually became part of the contract that then got recorded with a deed. Um, and that's why um, so many of them, you know, are saved in the city records. But these um, were a real industry for architects, apparently down um, in the French Quarter. Um, they, uh, they um, architects and surveyors set up engineers and they were displayed at the markets, you know, for the auction purposes in places like uh, the St. Louis Hotel and the Exchange and other auctioneers. Um, so this is the cover of volume one of the Friends of the Cabildo. And um, uh, it was a, you know, it was a really big effort. It was all volunteers. Samuel Wilson led it. He wrote the um, the, uh, one of the two essays in it, Bernard LeMann wrote the other one. And then um, there were uh, three volunteers um, who uh, led um, editing of it. And um, many, many other people contributed to it. But um, the, uh, a description of it was um, from Richard Campanella's uh, Bienville's dilemma, he says, this study inspired new appreciation for historic architecture outside the French Quarter and Garden Districts. It sets scholarly tone for local historical research and stirs modern preservation movement. So he was real, you know, he's pointing out that this was really the beginning of the preservation movement in uh, New Orleans. And we, you know, the Friends of the Cabildo should be really proud for their involvement in it. The PRC, the Preservation Resource Center, spun off from this. Um, they became more activists. You know, the Friends of the Cabildo's purpose was to support the museum. But, you know, we also are doing all this very important uh, research. So um, here are the three women who acted as the editors, um, photographed from the 1970s, Rulak Toledano, Betsy Swanson, who was the photographer, and Mary Louise Kristovich, who um, unfortunately died uh, a few years ago. But here they are with the book. And um, here they are again at the 25th anniversary of the publication of the book, um, where they uh, got together and this um, photograph was in uh, uh, the PRC's magazine. Um, Rulak Toledano um, is still uh, alive and we're, I think lives in Virginia or North Carolina, but I don't know um, where um, Betsy Swanson is. So this was the area that they studied. Um, you can see the highway, the expressway going right through this um, upper part, which is actually the lower part of it. French Quarter is um, to the top of the page. Um, and it, um, you can see what an impact this giant highway had running through here. And so um, in the middle here is Coliseum Square. And now you can see the convention center over here, but that wasn't built yet. And this, um, you know, was pretty much uh, derelict um, warehouses, um, you know, by uh, the 1970s. And, uh, um, it had, you know, kind of obliterated the historic riverfront in that area, but there's many, many historic properties um, that were left in this district. 
So the the Lord Sarpy Mansion was one of the um, it was one of the main um, trigger points for the preservation movement because this was right in the way of the exit ramp that goes next to the World War II Museum off the bridge, the first bridge. It comes down, it curves, and it landed right there. So this was Howard Avenue um, and now called uh, Andrew Higgins Way or Boulevard. But the in the middle, and it, you know, it's surrounded by other urban development, but this was a significant um, historic structure that the preservationists tried to save. They just said, you know, you don't, if you don't put the ramp there, we could save this building and it didn't happen. And, um, but then, you know, they went on to study all the buildings and preserve them. But so it was, um, this house was demolished in the, um, in, in 1957, it actually um, is not a plantation. It was a it was an urban house in the plantation style that you know similar to Madame John Legacy. It was built right to the curb, but with that French inspired West Indian architecture of the hip roof with the deep um, galleries on two floors, you know, supported by um, columns and. Uh, you know, it was really a shame. Um, according to uh, Mary Cable in her book, Lost New Orleans, um, if it had been saved, it would have been the only authentic plantation house in the center of the city, as well as the oldest building above Canal Street. So um, the people that ended up um, moving into the Lower Garden District, a lot of them were preservationists and when the um, federal government planned the second bridge over the Mississippi River, they, they wanted the, uh, a promise that the ramp that, that was built that came right down Camp Street and sort of fed right into you know, Coliseum Square like a mini highway, they, they wanted that removed. They also didn't want the bridge. So um, you can see that you know, from some of these signs, this was a protest, um, I think in 1976, um, it'd be fun to identify some of the people in this um, photograph. Um, when they did finish the bridge, the second span across the river in 1988, they didn't remove the, the ramp right away. They had to really pursue it hard. So that was another victory. And it made a big difference because that, Camp Street became a highway where you could speed up and get onto this ramp. And it, it really did lead to um, some of the degradation of the neighborhood. Apparently, you know, there was a lot of drug traffic through there in the 90s. And so it was, it was really a great thing to get that ramp removed. Um, so not all historic buildings were lost next to the highway. This one you can see, um, this is the bottom of Britannia Street, um, right at um, Calliope. So um, that's the highway. And you continued to the right, you'd be um, next to the back of the World War II Museum. There's a whole row of really beautiful historic buildings here. And it isn't, it hasn't been until the last few years that they've been um, restored. This one was the first one. And you can see it's um, quite a mansion. Um, this. Uh, Let's see, um, this one is called the General Twig House. It's in the um, volume one. And uh, during um, the Civil War, the federal troops occupied this, uh, um, this building and it was used as the headquarters for General ben Benjamin Butler. So um, he apparently moved on when another property further uptown became available. But an interesting note in the, in the Lower Garden District Volume One is that events taking place in this, the house from 1861 to 1863 were recorded in the diary of Julia Legrand. So would you love to read that diary to hear what General Twig, who was most likely a Confederate supporter because um, you know, those were the houses that the, uh, that the Union armies confiscated, um, you know, what he had to say about uh, General Butler. So anyway, it's a beautiful house. 
um, a mansion, you, um, you know, masonry structure with uh, Greek revival uh, details. So the work that was put into um, the Friends of the Cavildo Volume One ended up getting the um, the district listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, that was the documentation that they needed. It's the description of the buildings, their value historically. Um, the book has added all the, um, you know, the notarial archive information about ownership. Um, and uh, so, um, but what you see is how much smaller the district is than the area that they studied. And um, it's, you know, on this side of the, uh, the highway, it doesn't go onto the other side of St. Charles Avenue. Over here, it butts up against the um, Garden District and this is the Iris Channel, but it has this eroded edge. And that's because of all the structures that were lost. There wasn't enough uh, density of historic structures to make it a district. Um, and um, uh, so this was, you know, important uh, because once it was on the National Register, people could get tax credits for renovating their houses. And then a few years later, the city gave it the historic district um, designation, which um, controls what you can do. I mean, definitely you can't demolish anything that without review or, you know, renovate anything. So this um, block right here, I'm going to talk about next where this asterisk is. That was where the Solette um, mansion was. This was um, built in 1832 and it was a replacement for the original plantation house. The original owner was Thomas Solette and he had come to New Orleans from France. And by 1763, so the time of the Jesuits, um, or the time of the, um, uh, of the Spanish colonial period, he had bought five arpents of land and, from the Jesuits and his son, Francois, um, inherited it and ended up replacing it with this, um, again, a brick um, masonry structure and uh, the original plantation house is noted as being of the Colombage, which is where the wood, the wattle and daub interior walls. So this was a, a sturdier building. And many of those plantation houses, the lots and blocks were divided around them and they might've sat, you know, sat kind of irregularly, not in the center of a block. So when this was um, rebuilt, they centered it on one of, on the side street and subdivided the rest of the block around it. And you can see in the background, um, you know, there was a religious structure here. So um, over time, this building became a school. Um, it was also used as a hospital. Um, it was, uh, um, let's see, uh, it was called St. Simeon Select School for Girls, which was a finishing school and later became a parochial school, which I assume was associated with this church. And you can see these are all boys hanging out on the, on the fence um, in the front. And so um, in 1922, it became St. Luke's Private Sanitarium, a mental institution. And then in 1923, a descendant of the original owner bought the property and gave it to the Sisters of Mercy for their use as a hospital. And uh, it was um, used as a hospital until the Sisters of Mercy um, built a new building sometime in the 1950s in the mid city. The building sat vacant. It was damaged by fire and then demolished in 1959. So sad. So what happened in 1959 was that Schwegmans bought it. <laughs> the Schwegman Brothers um, was a giant supermarket chain, was founded by a German immigrant, um, Garrett Schwegman, and he started the family business just after the Civil War. So they've been around for a while, but um, he was known for innovative practices. So what he did with this whole block was he, um, he embraced the automobile, made the, put the supermarket in the middle of the site, put a parking lot around it, even put parking on the roof. 
Um, if you know the Whole Foods on Broad, that used to be a Schwegman's and it was um, the same design. It was by the architect uh, Ed Choi, who was a um, Chinese immigrant, came in the 1930s, um, was trained in the United States, worked in the aircraft industry and then started his own practice in New Orleans and did a lot of these kind of uh, mid-century modern um, uh, buildings. So unfortunately, Schwegman's also um, went out of business after um, Katrina, I guess. And a couple of years ago, the site was developed as um, the Delano. It's, a, it's called workforce housing. So it's rentals at market rate, you know, I mean, lower than market rate for people who qualify. Um, and uh, it's got about 200 units. Um, it's got a lot of amenities. It's got a parking garage and a swimming pool, I think. And um, it's filled that this entire site. So um, there's been a lot of trendy development um, happening in the on Lower Magazine Street and the Lower Garden District. You know those. Um, you know, first they're restoring everything that you know, can be restored, but then on empty lots, things are being built. So there's restaurants, there's, um, there's you know, some of the edge um, properties, there are those uh, breweries, you know, where you can go and spend, have a beer there. And uh, so it's, it's become very interesting. And the latest thing is this uh, St. Vincent Orphan Asylum um, renovation into the St. Vincent Hotel. If you hadn't heard about it, it's, um, it's really a pretty big deal. Um, this building was uh, originally built in 1864. And uh, there were a couple other buildings on the property too. That This is the, the facade that um, faces uh, Magazine Street. And um, it was um, needed to relieve overcrowded orphan orphanages um, for uh, children who lost their parents to yellow fever. And it was founded by the Daughters of Charity, but it was essentially 100% funded by Margaret Howery, the, um, the woman who was an Irish born immigrant who started a dairy and a bakery and is known for feeding you know, orphan children milk and bread and being um, very generous. Well, it turned out she, turned, she, she became quite an entrepreneur and um, was able to pay off this project, the cost of building this um, in, within in 16 years. And um, uh, at some point um, in 1990s, um, it became kind of a budget hotel, a hostel. And, uh, you know, it was where the garden, the lower garden district was kind of at at the time, you know, it was really an expensive place to stay. And, People said it was pretty creepy, but um, they've invested a lot of money in it. Apparently it has a wonderful restaurant, coffee shop, um, swimming pool. And, um, you know, you can kind of say it's uh, thanks to, Mad to Margaret Howery. So um, I didn't want to make my talk too long so I could take um, questions and also get uh, Robbie Cannaglosi to talk. Um, and, uh, so, um, Jason, are you there? I am. Let me see. Let me unmute Robbie. And we can, uh, if you want to start with him, I, I, I have a couple of questions for him as well, if you don't ask him, but uh, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and uh, if you did want to get the book, I have put a, a link to the, to the book in uh, the 1850 house from the 1850 house store, uh, as well as we have, all of the books available, you can buy them all at one time. We also have what we call the Cangelosi series, which is the last three books. Robbie's been the, um, the author of those three. So um, Robbie, thank you for joining us as well. Good evening, everyone. So um, Robbie, do you, your office is, was founded by Sam Wilson. So I'm just, you know, dying to know what you can tell us about him. I know how passionate he was about the Friends of the Cabildo, but you know, what what effort did it take to put this the first book together? And um, you know, how do you see you know the Friends going forward? You know, with more books. I know you're spending 
inordinate amount of time trying to finish the French Quarter book. Well, the firm, which was established in 1916, has um, always specialized in historic preservation, Richard Cope and Samuel Wilson. And um, as you mentioned, a lot of the early efforts were centered around um, saving individual buildings rather than whole neighborhoods. And it was, I believe, the Louisiana Landmark Society that tried saving the house that you mentioned from demolition. And they were the ones who sponsored a tour of this area. And I think the Picayune asked Sam Wilson, well, what do you call this neighborhood? And he goes, well, I really don't know. It's below the Garden District. So I guess it's the lower Garden District. And that's how he told me he came up with the name for the neighborhood. Since then, in later years, Sam doing some research says, oh, no, the Tom's Picayune or the Daily Picayune back then referred to this as Melpomania. And the people who lived in there were called Melpomanians, <laughs> which I'm glad that name didn't stick because um, I don't think it's such a quite flattering name. But there was, you know, at the time, 50 years ago, there was no HDLC, Sammy, as you mentioned. Um, there was no PRC. And the friends started doing building watcher tours of the neighborhoods. And they were very conscientious about choosing neighborhoods that didn't have a whole lot of recognition in starting these books. They intentionally did not do the Garden District or the French Quarter because those neighborhoods were pretty stable. The lower Garden District was threatened with being lost, as you already mentioned. Things were being demolished all of the time. And so the friends effort was to go into neighborhoods. And as you said, from after the book is done, it then becomes a National Register District. And then the state enabling legislation for historic districts statewide outside of the French Quarter was passed for the bicentennial. And so after 76, we could start having these other historic districts. And the Lower Garden District was one of the first um, historic districts in the state outside of the French Quarter. I am told that the Friends had a big debate on the type of book this should be. Some were advocating for a coffee table type book being very superficial. Others wanted something to be very scholarly at the time frame, And so they decided to do a blending of the two. Uh, of course, all of Sam's research was very detailed and documented with footnotes and things like that, maybe not included in the book, but I've got all of his research files which indicates where all the information came from. Now, the individual buildings, a lot of the stuff Sam had already done in the inventory section, but on some of the buildings there, it will say it's typical of this period or that period, and they didn't run full titles on all of the buildings. They did not have the resources that we have today. For example, um, I can search newspapers in New Orleans going back to 1830 by just putting in the address or name that wasn't available then. The Friends of the Cabildo created a database of building contracts recorded in the notarial archives and the mortgage office and the city permits office, which didn't exist back then. In fact, now HDLC is constantly calling me, Robbie, what you got in the Friends database for this building in the lower garden just to go some other neighborhood because they don't have the information. The Friends do. Um, people have asked me to do a rewrite of this book and some of the other earlier books. Um, I don't think I'll live long enough to do all of that. I'm trying to get the neighborhoods, which we haven't done. And Sandy, as you mentioned, I'm in the throes of doing the French Quarter book right now. I have done over a thousand entries already. And by an entry, for example, the um, Architects Row, which is a whole block of buildings, constitutes one entry. Although there may be 14 buildings there, they're all mentioned, but it's one entry in there. So it's a work in progress. Um, and you know, when I asked why wasn't the Garden District in the lower garden, I mean, the Garden District in the French Quarter had done, and that was the reason given to me by the people that had done this. Um, Sandy, I do have to correct one thing. In the photograph of the ladies there, on the first one, the lady to the far right is Sally Rees. That's not- Oh, uh, okay. The second one is correct. That is um, Betsy Swanson there, but that's Sally Rees. She's still alive and she lives on St. Charles Avenue. and uh, she's very involved with preservation and so forth still to this day. She's involved. She is the archivist for the military. That's Sally to the far right there. And oh, so Betsy isn't in the photo or? It's Rula Teledano. Yeah. Um, then it's um, Mary Lou Christovich. And then that is um, Sally um, Rees on the far oh, right. Okay. 
Um, so, and then the next one is that is on the far, that is Betsy Swanson on the far right there. Okay. Sally Reeves actually is still involved. She helped with the French Quarter book and some of the initial writings. And so she's still very active in the preservation movement. And she was one of the key early people with the Friends of the Cabildo and doing the books as far as the writing end goes. Betsy was the photographer. Betsy was the only paid person in any of this stuff. Everybody else was a volunteer and it still continues that way. All the people writing are volunteers. We still do pay for a photographer. Uh, these, for the Carrollton book and the French Quarter book, we retained a professional architectural photographer to shoot all those images there. Um, so the format that was set up for this book here, we still continue today. There are essays up front, and then there is the individual buildings there. Now, some people have said, well, the Friends of the Cabildo didn't include the building in their narration, so we can tear it down because it's not worthy of preservation because the, that's simply not true. Decisions had to be made. Sometimes, like when I'm doing it, just, I may like the building. It may be because of the age. It may be because a friend owned it or something like that. And in fact, in the last book, I even wrote that, you know, just because it's not included doesn't mean it's not worthy of preservation. Now, the one change for the French Quarter book is that we are doing every single parcel, including vacant pieces of land and parking lots in that book. So it will be different. It will be much bigger than the other neighborhoods in which they were selective houses chosen. As I said, it's not, it was never intended to be all inclusive. Um, but it, these were very pioneering um, because of the Friends series. We are the most documented uh, city in the nation as far as our historic architecture more than any other city. And this is due to the Friends efforts there. And there were a lot of very um, important people in the city and the Friends of the Cabildo that spearheaded this, that actually when the PRC spun off, a lot of the same people also were involved with the Preservation Resource Center. A lot of the same people have served on the commissions for HDLC and so forth. I serve on the Architecture Review Committee for the Downtown Historic District. And so out of these books has come a major preservation effort for the city. There's probably more than you wanna hear, but that's what you got. <laughs> wow, thank you. That was um, I, really informative. I've always been wanted to know more about the, you know, how it all happened. Jason, you have and a Rob, question? Yeah, um, I, I'm interested. I, I know that you work at your firm uh, on the weekends a lot, um, but do you, and I know you weren't involved in the first couple books, but do you, when you first came involved working in the books, I know Sam Wilson made you on, put you on the board without your asking, correct? Uh, actually, he volunteered my services to work on the book. And after working okay. on the book for Perfect. a year and a half, I was then put on the board. And within a year later, they made me president. Okay. So that, it was a quick could... ascent to um, my reign of terror there. Well, that works, um, with, works for my question then. So when you walked in for the first time uh, or, you know, first couple of times, how were they working um, to prepare these books? Were they working as a group at one house? Were they breaking it up in different sections? How did that work for them? Well, in the first book that I really worked on, as you said, I, I was still at LSU when 50 years ago when this was started. We worked over at Dorothy Schlesinger's house uh, on Arabella Street. Dorothy was involved with a lot of the books and she told me some of the early history. Originally, I think there was only planned to be five books. And, you know, we on the 10th book now, uh, but would work on her house over there. Sally Reeves would go there. Vernon Lemon would go there. I would go there. Sam continued to work in the office and so forth like that. But we all got together, um, not on the essays, but on the actual building history. And we would look at it. Um, some people had already gone to the archives to run the chain of title. And if you take the Friends program on how to research your property, that's the first step. You need to know the chain of title, but that's only telling you about the land, who owned the land when. And as, as Sandy um, mentioned, um, you can trace title to the land in the Garden District back to Bienville, but you don't need to do that because Bienville didn't build all these houses. And so with the chain of title from there, you look at other things. What details of this building is characteristic of this period? Now today, we're much more sophisticated, as I said, I'm looking at tax records, I'm looking at sewage and water board record hookups, I'm using the Friends database, I am using um, newspaper searches and all to help us and to pinpoint as best we can the date. Sometimes you simply can't get it, particularly in buildings on the French Quarter, which are very old. 
Um, but that's how it originally worked as an individual person's house. Um, tonight, um, every night I work on at least four to five new entries for the French Quarter book. So every night I work on a little bit more. Um, when COVID hit or when I go on vacation, <laughs> I've got a lot of time and I'm working on them then. It's, um, it, it, it's fun to do, but it does take a tremendous amount of time to do this correctly. And the friends have tried to stay away from what I call the moonlight manure stories, you know, um, the, the legendary stories that this is what was happened in, you know, Lafitte's blacksmith shop, which is not true. The, the custom house is built on bales of cotton that so-and-so built this building for a plantation house. And none of these things have turned out to be true. Um, I just gave a talk to the, the Daughters of Everything in Louisiana uh, yesterday, and they had just laid a reef on LaFon's tomb there and all, and they had come up with some stories about the fencing masters on Exchange uh, Place. And I'm going, well, there were fencing masters in New Orleans, but in my research, I've yet to find a fencing master on Exchange Place. A lot of attorneys there because the courthouse was right there. So as I say, we're doing more... Um, scholarly research into these buildings and because these tools are now available the friends early effort were very good well intended the only thing at the time but now we have more things and um i will be having some students and volunteers going out to check some things in the archives now that things are opening up such as the library to check the city tax records and all um i took French in high school. I went to Ecole Classique. My French is not very good. And we do have some volunteers that'll be helping translate um, the early French contracts for me. So um, it was originally at someone's house working on these books. Now it's pretty much in my house. Uh, yeah, I would imagine, Robbie, that, you know, if you'd have gone to a house on a Sunday and you guys would have gone and said, oh, these are all the houses we want to go through. And these, you know, this is what we're going to do. And then today you would have said, okay, let's just look them up on the internet and all this kind of stuff. Let's go up on the database. Then they would have taken these addresses and then they might've gone Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever. And they might not have found any information. And then so they report back, I didn't find anything on it. I mean, you can imagine how much time, I mean, I imagine how much time you're putting into it, but how much time, even more time when you really have no guarantee of knowing when you have to go to somewhere like the Norterio Archives or something like that, how much time they were spending doing that. Um, and, and it shows really, you know, uh, how much they wanted to preserve uh, these, uh, these neighborhoods through these books um, overall. Um, the, you know, there uh, is, Jason, there is more information that's in the books, that's at the, uh, the OUS Mint where the friends have put their records. Sometimes they decided not to include the book, but there may be a chain of title there. You can't put all of what Bernard Lemon called the bagats, all the owners in a write-up because the book would be an encyclopedia. So there is more information, as you said, of buildings that weren't done, more title information at the OUS Mint. Now it's a little hard to get to with COVID right now and all, but all of those records, all the chains of title, all the original research is down at the mint. And, and it's actually now inventoried, right? Robbie, we've confirmed that. With, uh, 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 all the old books uh, have been inventoried. I, uh, um, so, so you came out with Carrollton last year. Um, if you were, how long did, I know it took you a while because of Katrina and everything, but do you, if, it, if Katrina hadn't happened, how long do you think it would have taken you to finish that book? From, begin, from starting it to ending it? Uh, that's a hard question to answer because it's on a volunteer <laughs> base. It's not like I'm doing it uh, as a paid job. Well, no, I'm saying as a volunteer, time. as a volunteer, how long? As a volunteer, you're talking at least um, over um, five years. To give you an idea, the Garden District Association are paying people to do, they're doing a book on the Garden District and they are paying people to do $1,200 uh, a house there. Based on what's been done at Carrollton and what's been done in the French Quarter, the Friends of the Cabildo currently owe me three million dollars for just the read, not writing the essays, just on the individual houses. So it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, it's a love, it's a, it's something I love doing for the Friends and the city and all. But there's a lot of effort that goes into these books. 
And, and there's a good question uh, Spencer Dorsey asked. And if anybody has any other question, please put them in the chat. I'd love to, to, to ask them of Sandy and Robbie. Uh, but he does ask a question about give, uh, you know, what are good nonprofits or city resources for researching houses in the Lower Garden District? You know, for both of you, what other than these books, what are your other options? Obviously the friends class about how researching it, but um, how would you go about researching your house? today well you need to take the friends class or you can go to the public library's website and it does have a thing on there how to research your house and the first step is to do a chain of title which tells you all the owners of the property from that you need to look at sandburn insurance maps and the various maps such as the robinson and the brahm maps to see if the building is on the site you need to look at city directories based on um, the titles and who owns it. If it's rental property, it's not helping you. But if it's owner occupied, you can see if someone's living there. Now you have to be careful. Street names have changed and the numbering system in the city has changed multiple times. You can look at tax records. The city's tax assessments are at the New Orleans Public Library. You can look at sewage and water board record hookups if your house is built um, after 1896 or something. I've forgotten the exact date there. The Friends of the Cabildo database is something to check, which is not really available unless you're taking the Friends class in there. It hasn't been made public, although I think Jason was working on a grant from a law firm to help put it online for people to use for a small fee. Um, if you go to HDLC, they're not going to have a whole lot of information there. They've relied heavily on the Friends of the Cabildo's books there. Um, they also, the city paid my office at one time to do a form on every building in a community development neighborhood. And so there is a worksheet with a photograph, but it's it's like, this is a Greek revival building, typical of the 1840s. It's not very specific. It won't tell you that John McDonough built this house in 1852 at a cost of X number of dollars. So there is not really one resource that you can go to to get this information. If you happen to be in the book, then go to the old U.S. Mint and pull the sheet on it. Yeah, and actually we record we uh, recorded uh, the one we did in July this year. So if it's something that you're interested in and you want to learn about how to do that research, it's about a two hour lecture. We have some uh, documents and stuff like that, and we can send you uh, a, a Zoom link to that so that you could watch it. So you could basically purchase the, the class, take the class, not in real time, and then you can then do your research. But it does provide a great base. Um, so, uh, Sandy, do you have any other questions? Um, none for Robbie, no, but um, that was great. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Robbie, for taking the time. Uh, Sandy, that was a great lecture. And I, and, and I would just mention this. Uh, next year is the 50th anniversary of the American Sector one, which is basically the CBD. Uh, so sections of the CBD. We're going to be rolling out some more programming around that. Um, you know, please remember, I'll, I'll click the link, put the link in there again for if you did want to buy the book and you have access to the ability to buy all the books, we can get them all to you. Um, and we have the Lower Garden District tours that are upcoming uh, starting this Friday. Um, so we've got tours coming up related to this. And uh, excuse me, and then hopefully uh, we, and if you haven't, Purchase Volume Nine, which came out last year. Uh, we hope that you uh, take. Um, we'll, uh, we'll we'll get that as well. So, I want to thank Sandy Baptiste so much for taking the time to do this lecture tonight. Uh, Robbie, thank you for uh, adding a great little piece at the end as well, and talking about the history of these books. They really are special books, and uh, we hope to see everybody next Tuesday for talking about the Dixie Cups. As you can see, we do meet every aspect of New Orleans culture and history. We talk about music. We talk about architecture. Um, we have all different areas. So I think a membership to the Friends of the Cabildo will, you'll, you'll benefit a lot from that as well as you get to go see the museums as well. So I, I want to thank you all for uh, participating tonight and uh, we hope to see you next week. Sandy, thank you so much. Thank you. Jason, just a little note there. The Dixie Cups were one of the first, along with Alan Toussaint, to step up to help the Friends of the Cabildo, and they gave the concerts for raising the roof after the Cabildo burned. So yeah, the Dixie Cups are a part of our history. That's right. And, and the song Raise the, Raise the Roof was written by Alan Toussaint, right? That's correct. Yeah. Well, the so, friend. Yeah. So 
there you go. Another little tidbit to add on to why these books are really such an important aspect to our city. And, um, you know, someone did mention about um, the, the research question. I would also say that, you know, if you ever want to make a donation to the research on the book, um, we are always looking for that. Um, that always helps uh, pay for everything from photocopies to ink and all that kind of stuff like that to buy, uh, the doc, you know, pay for the documents at the Notorial Archives. That's always very helpful to the Friends. Uh, the Friends Board does put up some funds for it every year. And, and then sometimes Robbie's just paying for it himself sometimes. So um, that's always an option if you put it towards specifically that area. So thank you so much for tonight. And we hope to see you guys next Tuesday at six o'clock. Night. Thanks, Sandy. You're welcome.